This episode of the Design Your Dream Home podcast is brought to you by CRAN. CRAN is the Custom Residential Architects Network and by Porcelanosa. Porcelanosa is a luxury lifestyle brand that brings modern European design into your home. You are listening to the Design Your Dream Home podcast with Doug and Steve. Doug and Steve are architects and they're here to help you design your dream home. So today we're talking with John DeForest of DeForest Architects. He's located in Seattle, Washington and Tahoe City, California. So welcome, John. Great to have you. Great to be here. So I had the opportunity to see John speak at a CRAN convention many moons ago, Uh and uh, his work is wonderful. Uh, What stuck out to me back then was that his projects uh, were both very respectful of his clients' budgets, which which doesn't always happen, uh, but they're also very creative, uh, which made for some which makes for some beautiful architectures. As an aside, I re- also remember John. He doesn't know this, but um, he allowed us to use uh, Crayon to use some of the, the photographs of his work in the videos that I was producing for Crayon. So thank you very much. They made uh, the videos much more <laughs> visually appealing. <laughs> so, well, you're welcome. Thank you. So uh, John is from Seattle originally. He went to Yale and then Harvard GSD. He founded John DeForest Architects with the vision of developing a more collaborative, creative approach to design. Uh, He's also got a clear passion for making new connections among people, uh, buildings, and ideas. He's married. He's got two young kids. And what what I loved on his website is he said that one of his distant relatives invented the radio tube, which is, of course, the vacuum tube, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, that is responsible for, of course, early electronics and ultimately making computers possible. So holy cow, you're actually the reason (laughs) we're talking on Skype in some ways. (laughs) So anyway, um, John, again, it's great to have you. Uh, Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? And we always love to hear uh, why the architects that we talked to became architects. Well, sure. And uh, speaking of radio tubes, I was the kid who uh, people always brought old appliances to to either fix or uh, take apart and uh, I just love doing that and figuring out how things worked and then putting them back together so I thought I was going to be an engineer oh my gosh Uh, that's what I went to started off in in electrical engineering of all things and by the time I took my first studio course in architecture and totally fell in love with it I pretty much already done the electrical engineering stuff so I ended up double majoring but oh my gosh that first studio course was the turning point. And I, I remember talking with my girlfriend who became my wife that it just seemed like a much more fun way to invent. And I loved the people and the environment. So before you knew it, got an apprenticeship, getting out of undergrad, worked for a great guy, Duo Dickinson. He showed me that you could have fun doing architecture and be friends with your clients. Huh. And I All thought right. that's pretty great. So eventually went back. I went and worked in San Francisco, worked in Connecticut, went back to grad school, and then came back to Seattle and started my practice about, I think I worked for about three years for someone else who was also great, and then started my practice. So where did you work in Connecticut? Uh, Duo Dickinson. Oh, uh, wow. office, yeah, right out of uh, undergrad. He would take one person a year to be an apprentice, and the cool thing about that was he and his partner at the time co-owned a a high-end woodworking shop. So I would do my drawing, you know, my fledgling hand drawing upstairs. And then I'd bring it down to the guys in the shop who'd be making a wall of cabinets and they'd laugh at me and, you know, <laughs> set me right about how things were made. And uh, I also had a few chances to actually do kind of the menial shop tasks, you know, like sanding miles of shelving and things like that. So between, you know, being a happy architect and get along with clients and understanding how things are actually made, that was, that was a great match for me. Wow. So and we, did uh, we that, actually though. interviewed Duo Dickinson yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not long ago. So yeah. that was that was kind of crazy. He's a dynamo. Yeah. Yeah, he sure is. Holy cow. You know, I, I was interested in, in reading your about your practice. And I think that the word that kind of struck me uh, was having this collaborative approach. And huh? every time you read bios, everyone talks about that. But yeah. I really feel like, you know, when I read things like homework assignments for clients and it seems like getting the client involved and making them really part of the process is uh, very important to your to your work method. Can you explain a little bit about more more about that? Absolutely, and, I, and I'll say, you know, I've never met an architect who said that they were uncollaborative. Right, right. So I'm I'm aware we we have to test ourselves. So we try to hold our feet to the fire and make sure that we're actually doing it. So what does it look like? 
And I can tell you a little bit about that, but I think it's important to know where it comes from, uh, which really goes back to that studio experience that, that I had that I think a lot of us fall in love with design in design school as this kind of intersection of interesting people and ideas and creativity. And when I got out of school, I sort of felt like I was surprised that in some practices it felt like we kept all the fun to ourselves and that didn't feel right. It felt like, hey, I'm working for somebody. I want them to have as much of that fun experience as I um, had in school. So that's uh, part of why we go to those lengths to involve people. I also think it's a good business model um, because we're really working side by side with people, not trying to get them to bow down to some agenda that we have. So to your question, Steve, and like, how do we, how do we do that? There are tons of ways, but at, at the beginning, we do have a series of homework assignments that we give people, and those are designed to help us get to know a couple things. Get to know what really matters to people way down deep. I mean, there's going to be time later to talk about, you know, where the silverware goes and how high the base trim is and things like that. But we always wanted to come back to what's meaningful to them. And I'd say a lot of people, especially today, treat design as kind of a, a personal investigation. They're trying to figure out what what their life is about and how they want to live. So starting with those really deep ideas of, hey, I want to connect better with family or with nature. It's usually about connection. Mm -hmm. or I want to simplify my life. I want to think about how I want to live. So they're actually kind of touchy-feely exercises. I'll give you an example. One is we ask them to write down everywhere they've lived for any length of time, and then to choose five of the most memorable. And when we consciously coach them on not telling us the details and what style it is and things like that, we ask them to describe it in terms of the five senses. So somebody might say, gee, I'll never forget, I'll use my own personal example. Mm -hmm. You know, I never forget staying over at my grandparents' house and seeing the snow out the window and feeling the sisal carpet that they had on the, the floor under my feet, et cetera. And that helps us start to get past words uh, to things that are really stronger feelings. So then when we start designing, we've got that in mind. We're also able to use that language to talk with them about it. So instead of using all the lingo that we use in school, mm. I don't think any client has ever asked me for interstitial spaces and infrastructure <laughs> and things like that. Uh, you know, we're talking about experiences that they've had. And that, that becomes kind of a, a divining rod for the project. When things get complicated and you're having to make difficult decisions, we can always go back to that and say, hey, you remember, I'm thinking about one client in particular who uh, realized after writing all those experiences that they were all about sound and how important it was to have quiet places for him. And so that's something we go back hmm. back to, regardless of you know what the kitchen countertop was, that that was going to be kind of soul satisfying for him. Well, let me follow up on this because I've encountered lots of clients that think that all these new technologies are making it easier. And in fact, I'm not sure it is, meaning they're grabbing all these Pinterest images and sending me idea boards on house and it's all this kind of visual information mm -hmm. and it's very different than what you're talking about right now right it's it's not these images it's something you're talking more about feelings experiences how, how do you what do you think about that i totally agree that the access to imagery has been wonderful in ways but it's also emphasized that so some of the things that we do to counteract that i mentioned you know homework assignments even though we have pretty much the highest end, super high tech software, which is great. Uh, we still go through some element of a hand process somewhere along the line. So that might be tearing up cardboard and modeling in front of a client, not just doing a pretty finished model. We do some kind of cool space planning things with physical wood blocks. It sounds kind of like kindergarten, and it is. Uh, what's wrong with that? We have dozens of tape measures in the office. Like I probably have five at my desk right now because I'm always losing them. Right. So that we're constantly measuring and we're measuring with clients, you know, and I'm sitting at a conference table that I know is three by eight feet long. And I have a sticker on the wall that tells me the conference room is 16, eight by 15 something. It's too far away. So we're always trying to bring it back to something that's physical and meaningful, not just visual. Hmm. It's a kind of ongoing effort to do that. So when talking about 
architecture as experience, how do you then relate it back to style? How does your office deal with style and architects, your preferences versus your clients' preferences, or does anybody have a preference? I think everybody has a preference. So it's easiest to market your firm by a style and to develop a body of work. And uh, I think that can be a really valuable way to do it to build a practice Mm. for us learning is a really high value as well as empathy and again kind of helping guide this creative journey for clients so that's that starts with the homework assignments where we're talking about not about like hey i want to perfect this form of building i've been curious about this technology it's figuring out what's important to them and then honoring that so some of that's just a matter of integrity you know of, of not getting too caught up on our own own agenda. But, you know, we all have preferences about what we think looks cool. I think we just really have, we've been through this process enough that we know that really going on the client's journey takes us a different place to different places. And if we enjoy learning about design and we enjoy the possibility that it creates, then, then we can let some of that ego go. It's not a matter of, it's not that we don't have egos, that we don't have ideas. We certainly bring leadership to the process. We're trying to build that around things that matter to the client. Wow. Um, so it's kind of a much more complicated message, but I think it's good for the profession. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know if you can see the pictures behind me on the wall, but there's a pretty wide range from traditional to farmhouse to, and that's not that's not a sign of you know attention deficit disorder. That's us really authentically trying to follow the client's cues. And I'd say one ask one one thing to add there that goes back to this, Steve and your comment about Pinterest is. Culturally, we live in a time where geography is meaning less and less. Um, so our clients bring lots of influences. So they maybe they grew up on the East Coast and that's really strong, but they've lived in you know Europe or something like that, been influenced by modernism. They've seen things. So a lot of them are kind of confused about like, what style am I? Who am yeah, I? I'm like, sure. And they feel like they need to walk into an architect's office saying. I've got to figure it out. I want X bedrooms and bathrooms and X style. And that if they don't have that, that they're somehow bad clients or that the, that the architect is going to, you know, run off in the wrong direction. Mm. Um, you need to dispel that. It's interesting. Cause I, you know, I, some of the architects that I really enjoyed growing up, you know, Neutra and Schindler and these types. And I remember yeah. Neutra talking about giving people these big checklists and um, clients would have to fill out these things. And, and of course, his buildings all look the same. <laughs> so I, was, I, was, I said, well, what? yeah, what's happening here exactly. So maybe it's already people coming in because they already know they want, you know, what he does or something like that. It's very different than let's say somebody comes to you and say, they've not necessarily seen a building that they like or the style. They say they've heard the process is really enjoyable that, that he'll work with you or they'll work with you to find, you know, your home, something like that. Um, exactly. You know, the questionnaire that we have isn't, you know, in the case of Neutra Schindler, like, which color would you like, white or black? <laughs> um, the questions that we have are all about values, you know, like values and hopes and fears and things that you bring to the process. All the questions about, you know, do you want one or two dishwashers or, you know, do you want rooftop solar or something like that? That's more of a quantitative laundry list we get to that later Mm -hmm. Um, but i would say on the on the other side of it what you said about people do come to us for the process trusting that it's going to end up with a building that's really resonant for them i mean that's the goal for us it can also be a little bit of a hard sell because they may look up at that wall and say i don't i don't see what i want so now i'm Mm -hmm. you know can you guys do it or do you like to do what i want to do are you gonna be good guides so i think just over time people have seen the we can now show people like, hey, here's a project where they started with this. Here's how we worked with them. You know, that looked like fun. <laughs> and here's what it meant to them at the end. I guess it's, I guess it's scary because I always, always think about it from our perspective. But if I don't know what I want and I come sit down with you and I'm, I'm, I'm nervous because I, I have no idea and you're asking me these questions and, and I'm spending money and I, I don't know what's going to happen. It's right. I don't know what this is going to be. And you have to kind of really trust you and your firm and to take them down this path, right? It requires a certain type of person that is willing to have that trust. Totally. And, and, you know, some of that has track record. 
some of it is I just have, I, I really empathize with clients. You know, maybe it's because I started in engineering and I thought, you know, all the cool kids were in design and I wasn't quite up to that. Uh, <laughs> but it is a lot of money and it is a risk. And I don't downplay that. You know, this mm-hmm. is, it's an adventurous process, I think, at least the, the clients that come to us. And an adventure can be what I think of, you know, it's, it's fun, you learn, you it takes you interesting places and it's a really meaningful experience in addition to where you actually get. It can also mean that it's really, it can be a euphemism for this is going to be a air quotes adventure. And it, that means it's going to be scary and risky. So partly my partner is, uh, Brett is a, was a former river guide. And so he uses a lot of river guiding metaphors that <laughs> I've now adopted. I've never <clears throat> rafted, but you know, we, we see ourselves as kind of the river guide equivalent. We're not, we can't completely control the river and we're, we're going to be paddling alongside our clients. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to map out a great trip with them and we're going to kind of manage it as we go so that they can have the fun and excitement and some of the, you know, difficulty and challenge, but we try to buffer them from that. That's a model of a, if design is a kind of personal journey, that's where we aim. There are other good ways to do it where it's much more like, okay, I'm going to get on the bus tour. I'm going to follow a person on the flag. I'm going to make sure that the person with the flag and make sure that I, you know, check all the boxes. And then the other extreme is, you know, you parachute into some completely foreign place and you don't know the language. They talk about interstitial spaces and infrastructure, you know, and you don't, and it's, it's really risky and scary and probably not that fun for most people. So we're trying to be somewhere in the middle. This episode of the Design Your Dream Home podcast is brought to you by Cran. Cran is the custom residential architects network. Cran is the leading resource and voice for architects who focus on collaborative design with homeowners. Cran provides support, advocacy, and education for custom residential projects, as well as professional development for its members via forums, symposia, publications, and local activities. To learn more about CRAN, visit www.aia.org forward slash CRAN. This episode of the Design Your Dream Home podcast is brought to you by Porcelanosa. With 30 showrooms in the United States and Canada, Porcelanosa is a luxury lifestyle brand that'll make your next project's dream into a reality. From a wide selection of tiles and mosaics to modern bathroom and kitchen cabinetry designs, Porcelanosa makes it easy to bring modern European design elements into your home. Visit porcelanosa-usa.com to learn more. As, as a follow-up, Doug, you know, maybe, I, actually, I'd like to hear your recap. We had a, a guest last week. Um, she uh, works in a firm that does design, I mean, they design build. And I think that they are a firm that sometimes maybe they have a model and they start building this model on speculation. And then a homeowner, once they sort of see it 80% done, they can kind of come in and customize it to a certain extent. It's a very different kind of person that that would then come see with you. I mean, Doug, can you can you kind of, sort of recap that the differences maybe the way you see these two kinds of firms well i think yeah i think at some point the business becomes much more personalized or the a building can become much more personalized relative to the people that are you know making it so you you, we end up with these different kinds of firms one is probably closer to a design build firm where you're you know you're designing something for a general client and then you're you know, putting it together and you're making money on it, right? It's more it, it's more about owning the land and making money long term and it's a business. And then you've got architecture firms that are maybe more, way more focused. I mean, John's got lots of architects that are working for him, whereas the firm that we were talking about last week or talking to last week, they had they might have one or two other architects and people are more specialized in building businesses, right? So yeah. It's a completely different animal. I think it really depends on what you're looking for. So you get clients, they start making phone calls, they're looking for somebody to help them design something. And they really, they say, we really don't need a whole lot of help. You know, uh-huh. we just, we're just looking for a building and we want to alter a few things. Yeah, the finishes, uh, they'll pick the I think finishes, the challenge right? there long term is that, you know, most people realize once they get in to the process that they would love to control a lot more than they initially thought. And so it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's why John's office is clearly busy. John, I wanted to ask you, uh, I'm always interested to hear when uh, somebody owns more than one location. So you guys Uh are two places. How did that happen? Yeah. 
Pretty simply, Brett, I hired as an intern, as a overqualified, underpaid intern, I don't know how many years ago now, and he just became indispensable. But uh, at one point, uh, he was working in the Seattle office and he said, hey, I love what's going on here, but my family and my heart is in Tahoe. You know, would you consider opening a, an office there? As it's turned out, it, it's worked surprisingly well. He's here, you know, typically one week a month and everything that happens like we're doing right now via the internet um, works well. And it, it also fits the sort of long-term strategy that we've had of working widely but closely. This is th thanks in part to t many types of technology and some to just coincidence that, you know, somebody called us years ago from Iowa and said, you know, hey, do you know, we love your work. Do you know any good architects in Iowa? And, and I said, no, but we could be in Iowa. Right. Um, and we figured it out. And over the years, you know, we're not jet setter architects. We're not a big firm. We're, we're, we're committed to really working closely with people, but wherever, wherever they find us. So we have uh, recently finished a project in Michigan and Montana. We have several going on in, in California now. Wow. So Brett having the office in Tahoe there it helps with some of the California projects, but surprisingly, the location isn't as much as an obstacle as it used to be. Right. We're finding that with most architects that we talk to nowadays. Uh -huh. Very interesting. So let's pivot a little bit, uh, talk a little bit, or give us an idea of some of the things that you've been thinking about of late as an architect, as a practicing architect in your location. I'm not, I'm not sure if you recall the email that I had sent, but I had asked to Maybe give some thought to three things. If you haven't done that, it's not a big deal at all. Yeah, um, things that might be useful for a homeowner. Yeah. That's what, kind of what, what our focus has been. Yes. Yeah. Let's uh, talk a little bit about what our listeners would be interested in. Of course, I have, you know, tons of advice because most of our clients are first timers. You know, I think some, if, if people are starting out, the, a lot of this will sound obvious, but maybe it helps to remind them. Yeah. Start with the big picture. And we talked about some of that. I don't just mean budget and schedule, things like that, those are really important. I mean, like, why are you doing this? Huh. What does this mean in your life? Often in the first phone call that I have with somebody, if it seems comfortable enough, I'll say, how do you want this project to change your life? And that's not grandiose. It's just mm -hmm. honestly, hey, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of time and effort. It's a great privilege. It's a privilege for us to be part of. I want to do more than solve the problem of designing a house. I want to, you know, in some small way, Let's design the next step of your life. Mm. We're also big fans of thinking big and building small. We've designed houses from 1,200 square feet to probably 12,000. I prefer the smaller ones probably because there's kind of a higher design quality per square foot to them right. often. And there are just some, some lifestyle and some sustainability reasons to do that. So I've learned so much from my clients. I, I am, I'm thinking back to... Uh, a couple that have become great friends who they hired us to renovate a house and they actually wanted us to make it smaller. <laughs> you know, like normally people are adding on and they realized they wanted to be close as a family. They didn't want to take care of tons and tons of space. It was a house that had an intercom system, which was a bad thing oh for them. <laughs> so think big, build small. Wow. Uh, a team approach is, is another one of those kind of obvious things that everybody says. But I think as people are starting the process, you know, find people who you trust who work well together. Um, and I think they should lean on their architect uh, as kind of a early point person for that. Another kind of related one is to think long term and plan for change. So housing is super expensive now. I don't think, you know, we have any clients uh, at any budget who take the amount of money involved lightly. So we don't do projects that are designed to turn around and you know, be sold the next year. Mm -hmm. So, and then another great thing about having worked for a while now is that I've seen people at all different stages of life, you know, from having young kids to having grandkids. And mm -hmm. I've now been sent through some of those. My website is now really out of date. Like I don't have two young kids. I just sent one off to college <laughs> this weekend. Um, right. the, the photograph's probably out of date too. Um, so... <clears throat> Out of I date. I, that's why I was looking at your website. I was like, oh, we've got two young kids. I wonder what, yeah. what. that's How funny. Do you do that? <laughs> uh, but I like, think when you think about a house, like I think sometimes people build too much because they're designing for every possible state of the family. So instead think about like, okay, you know, I don't need my workout room now, you know, when the kids are home, who am I kidding? 
that's going to be a bedroom. So that you also don't end up having to move because the kids are out of the house and all of a sudden you feel like you're rattling around this huge house. Right. Um, so I like thinking long term. And then a lot of it we've been talking about is really just enjoying the ride. I do think this is a luxury and a, a privilege to work with clients this way. And I think it needs to be as much about the experience as the end product. So I was thinking about this, uh, you guys can see on the screen, but not hear this, but we're in the land of Starbucks and, and Starbucks figured out that, you know, good coffee is great, but uh, having the neighborhood place that you stop by every day and you see people, you know, that's part of what they're selling too. It's not for everybody, for, but for our clients, I think they see designing a house or other things that we design is as much a journey uh, and experience of like, hey, I've always, a lot of them have thought about going to architecture school or started or something. They say, I've always been fascinated by this. And that's a great client for us. Uh, so anyway, that's some thoughts about how to get started. That's amazing. You, you know, can I ask, because Doug, Doug had mentioned, I asked about how he knew you and he said he watched one of your talks and he said that one of the things that really struck him was that you were designing for, yes, yeah, some bigger projects that have bigger budgets, but also you didn't mind at all to do something that was smaller and had a very small budget. And it's, you know, we've had some guests on that, oh, we only do a million dollars or whatever. It sounds like that's not really something that motivates you. I think it seems like you like, I don't know, the design challenge. It doesn't really matter if it's a low budget or a small house or a big house or a big budget. Is that is that fair? Absolutely. I mean, we want to work on projects that bring out the best in us and that we can bring out the best in. I didn't say that very well, but we have to make sure that people's budget matches their aspiration. Like I don't want to go down a road that's not going to work for everybody. So mm -hmm. I've been talking about some of the the fun part. When when my kids were five, we talked all the time about like you have to eat your peas before you have your dessert. And so in the office, we've, we've kept that going for 20 years now. Um, so the dessert part is the design and the adventure and all that stuff. The peas part is hey, we, we need to be realistic about budgets and schedule. And we won't start a project if we don't feel like we have a good viable roadmap. And frankly, a fairly high percent of the time when we sit down with people, there's like, oh, thank God you told me about all of this stuff because nobody else was telling me the truth. I didn't know whether it was this cost and that cost and so, so forth. Right. But what I've learned is it's a, I was brought up to tell the truth anyway, but the value of kind of giving it to people straight is that, then the projects that do make sense to go forward, go forward on a really sound track. Whether that's a big project or a little project, doesn't matter as much. We just want to make sure that we can really add something, we can bring something out in it, however big or small it is. Mm. And I think that's one of the problems that most people face that take on the process alone or without professionals is they dive right into the design part. Like this is the way I want my living room to look, or my right. family room or my kitchen. And then they got, and they try to put it all together, and it's really, really difficult to do that. Instead of asking all these really difficult questions, I love that eat your peas first thing is amazing. I mean, that is really what everybody should be doing when they're designing. Is I, I often say to people who want to become better designers, if you ask the right questions, design your design will be better. So you have well, to ask those questions first. And I, I think as a profession, we could do a much better job of helping people solve the whole problem. And I, what I see is a lot of people that come to our doors have been told a part of the picture. Mm. You know, they've talked to a contractor, the contractor says, well, you know, here's X dollars per square foot. This is what things are costing. And then they talk to the architect and the architect says like, well, here's how we charge. And even in addition to those two pieces, there are tons and tons of other ones, permits and surveys and other engineers and special inspections and things. And not enough people put together the big picture, I think, because they're A, worried about scaring people off, and B, worried about shooting the messenger, and C, really more than anything, I think we're all kind of precision-oriented, so we shy away from speaking in generalities. So like when, when we present the potential cost of a project before we even design, we've got probably 30 or 40 lines of potential costs that go into it. And we're guessing at all of those. And we just trust that our clients are going to be fair, that we're not going to guess any of those numbers right, but that they want the straight scoop. Like, here's all the stuff that goes into it. Should we do it or not? And again, even though it's I, I'm sometimes the, the bad news guy, yeah, um, it's a lot more painful later if you, like what you were talking about, Doug, 
they put together the truth much later after they spent a lot of money and they put their heart and soul into it. And I think that's that's part of why the the profession sometimes gets a bad rap because because they should because they kind of get people deep into the process just designing their dream without having any indication whether that's feasible. So anyway. You know, th- th- this conversation about process to me is really interesting because um, I just want to relate a quick story. I Years ago, I bought a Mini Cooper, and as part of that process, this is in the beginning when you could customize it. You get everything is unique, so there's all these combinations. You can order this color, that stripe, this horn, this, and and so that was really fun. And there was your own little website, your own portal, and basically there was also cost surety. I knew exactly it was twenty one thousand and forty forty four dollars to be ready in eight right. weeks or eight whatever, eight, six weeks, something like this. And I felt like a designer. I felt like oh, uh-huh. I customized my car and or house. And so every time I see a website which basically poses something like this, I send it to Doug. I say, Doug, this is making, <laughs> and it's like design your house for forty three hundred dollars, and now you just have yeah. to type in the number of rooms, the style, the color, and then pops out this house. And this is technology that's going the wrong way. And I sort of, <laughs> I, I think that the things you talk about with process and it's going to take some time and that there are things that you've created to help with this process, whether it's a homework or assignment or what have you. I mean, I, I find that all that really interesting. I, I, I mean, it sort of, for me, reaffirms that that's the right way. Like there has, it, it, it's not easy, but I think it's the way to to really get what I think people will be happy with, or most people, let's say, and maybe some people are happy with just a spec house that's been sort of customized a little bit with some finishes and maybe that's fine for a lot of people but for someone who wants something different or special or it's going to take a little bit more time and effort and and the right architect i guess that's a fascinating point i hadn't thought about it quite that way we we have a a fair number of people who come in after talking to prefab builders okay which is can again i don't there are lots of good ways to get things done it depends on what you're trying to get done but i think the appeal of that is like you say the certainty and the promise of almost sort of do it yourself, all, like all the urges that people come to us with, like, hey, I almost went to architecture school and this seems like fun. I want to customize my Mini Cooper. Right. We tap into as well. And we offer just a tremendous more variety of choice. And I think more importantly, it's that almost a psychology in the beginning of like, what's it all about? You know, so for your Mini Cooper, it's like, hey, what do you want to say about yourself? Like, what do you, what gets you really excited that's something that can get left out of the automated process. And we're, we're really interested in tools. We're really interested in new design and construction methodologies. So I, it's, it's not that I wish we could go back to hand drafting everything, mm-hmm. but I think the risk is that we could start to, to lose the, the human element. So maybe in the future, everything will be mass customizable and you, know, you can 3D print the design, but there's always gonna be a role one of several roles for an architect is is the person in the beginning who's saying like, hey, what's it all about? And I think that's indispensable. I am a little bit worried about where things are going in just sort of mass production of things that look design look like design. Mm. And I always say, you know, design is more than a noun. It's more than the Michael Graves teapot mm-hmm. or whatever. You, you know, in Seattle, we have a certain type of sort of boxy a fiber cement clad building that that looks somewhat cool somewhat like what you'd see in dwell but doesn't really have a heart and doesn't have good detailing and good mm-hmm. design so it's design is a verb it's not just a noun and that's something that you don't get from a an assembly line process john do you teach architecture no you should why don't you <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe i'm surprised thank you be very good at it oh thank you had a lot of time to think about it. Yeah. Hey, Doug, any last um, last thoughts um, with John? I don't want to take up more of his time. It's been a, some amazing, um, amazing information. Well, thanks. No, I think I'm. I think I'm good. I'm really impressed, John, with your thoughtfulness in regard to what you're doing, and it seems like you've really developed a wonderful clientele and a body of work, and uh, it's great. Very well, impressive. Thank you. I, I appreciate your being even interested in what we're doing over here in the corner of the country. And and I do feel, you know, this is totally sincere. I feel so fortunate to work with the people that we do who trust us with those dreams and also with their being beginners at things, you know, mm-hmm. so often the people who can afford to do this are experts at something. 
Mm. Um, and so for them to come in and say, gosh, you know, I don't know how to draw. Like, I don't know how to, you know, what style am I? That's a thing I really admire that people are willing to be beginners. And that's something we cult- cultivate in the office is how do we not let our skills and experience get in the way of bringing a fresh eye to everything. So, John, do you want to give us your coordinates? Tell us, uh, tell our listeners where they can find you, how they can find you. Oh, I thought you were going to ask me for our longitude and latitude. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 47. Uh, absolutely. DeForestArchitects.com. And I, it's a funny enough name that I think if you just search for DeForest Architects, it's just us. It's 12 of us. So you might get my wife at the front desk, but other than that, you're probably going to get me. So. Oh, that's great. It's like DeForest Architects in the Pacific Northwest. That's like um, my, my firm would be what? Steve, <laughs> no. Brick, Steve Brick Architecture? Is yeah. That? Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, John. All right, that. John. Thanks very much for your time. All right. Thank you. You've been listening to the Design Your Dream Home podcast with Doug and Steve. If you have any questions or want to give us any feedback on the show, feel free to reach us through our website at the Show.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>